you don't have to clap till afterwards. You can like you know wait, hold your because it might suck. So um, hey, so thanks for thanks for coming. I'm Douglas Merrill. I want to talk a little bit about a hype cycle. So I've been privileged to be doing artificial intelligence for almost 30 years, which is uh, a depressing number, but sounds really good. So it buys a bunch of credibility. So you guys should all, like believe me. I've been doing this a long time. Um, and in those 30 years, I've seen a lot of hype cycles. There have been times when AI has been popular, and times when AI has been you know, irrelevant, and we've changed names a couple of times. So this week, we're machine learning. But all in all, it's roughly the same thing. The cool thing about, about hype cycles is the behaviors during the cycle. So when, when you're at the bottom of a hype cycle, no one cares what you do. You go to cocktail parties. You say, yeah, I do machine learning for a living. And they're like, oh, really? Nice watch. Um, but when you're at the top end of a hype cycle, all kinds of stuff happens. You, you can't tell what you do at cocktail parties, because otherwise people ask you questions about whether the, the robot overlords are coming. And the press writes a lot about it. Right? But the worst thing about being at the top end of a hype cycle is the emergence of the true evil. The true evil, the consultant. So what I would like to do today is help protect you from the consultant and their primary weapon, the loathsome lie. Or not. There we go. So let's set some context first. Uh, first of all, uh, Mark Andreessen famously said the software was eating the world. He's probably right. But it's very clear that machine learning is, in fact, eating the world. Uh, almost every industry has begun uh, some amount of aut automation, right? There's some degree of AI kinds of stuff happening, some more than others. There's lots of reasons why. But it's not a really safe position to sit here and say, my industry my company, my job, whatever, is safe from ML. But when the consultants show up, they're going to lie to you, because that's what they do for a living, right? Consultants, I used to be one, uh, are specialized in separating you from your money. So let's talk through some lies and try to, to arm you against them. The first lie is that ML is just math, and all you need to do is push a button. You know, you just push the button and the right thing happens. This comes in the form of, hey, look, this particular algorithm solves the world's problems. This comes in the form of, hey, this tool set will allow you to get all the benefits of ML and know nothing. The problem is that isn't really true. So 31337 is 1990s hacker speak for elite. So this says that the right ML program will make you elite. It won't. Primarily, it won't because most of ML is actually an art, not a science, despite the fact we've been doing it for arguably 50 years. There's still lots of things about the math we don't understand. And then there's special things you just have to learn to do, notably things like missing data. Right, it turns out that missing data has a huge impact on your models. And almost nobody spends time understanding how and why. And the button pushing solutions don't do the right thing. So you cannot simply buy a, buy a box and suddenly become an ML expert. It's ironic that I'm saying this since my company sells ML tools to help financial services firms underwrite. So I'm a little bit talking against myself here. But nonetheless, it takes some art as well as some science. Don't buy from anybody who says the tools answer the problem. And maybe you guys in the back should just flip. There we go. Oh, back one. Come on. OK, I'm going to let you all flip from now on. So uh, the second lie is that the benefit of machine learning comes from some piece of magical data. Oh, if you just had renting data. Oh, if you just had bank account data. Oh, if you just had shoe color data. I'm currently wearing black shoes with like a white spot on top. Does that make me a good credit risk? I don't know. That's not really true. So it is true to some extent. Uh, as you add more data, you add more entropy. You add more information, which makes it more likely that a model will yield a good outcome. The problem is most of the time you don't really need that entropy. Uh, Zest has no clients who in their first model used anything other than what they already had lying around. And they got re we've gotten really massive wins across all of our client base. It's not j data matters and getting the right data matters, but you go a long way while just understanding what you already know. It's not magical data. It's the right kind of math applied to the data you have. Ultimately, you're going to have to add data. But rarely at the start. Next slide. Somebody hit? Thank you. Uh, cool. So uh, every time I do an interview on AI, I, I get asked the question, oh, are you using Facebook data? 
Uh, we currently have no clients who use Facebook data. Uh, for a variety of reasons, not least of which is, I think that's creepy. I don't really necessarily think you should be using social media data, but your mileage may vary. But whether you want to or don't want to, it isn't required. You don't have to be creepy to build good ML models. And more importantly still, you, everyone tells you, oh, you, you can't understand the signals in this model because they're made of this 97-way interaction that involves shoe color. To the extent that there's a signal in your model that you find incomprehensible, it shouldn't be in your model. Mortgage and credit applications for many, many years have used payments income ratio as a really important credit signal, right? PTI is in every credit model in the world. It's also in pretty much every ML credit model in the world because it's semantically important. It turns out it matters if you have enough income to make your payments. That doesn't seem that hard. Just because ML is involved doesn't necessarily mean that all the signals have to be either incomprehensible or creepy. Next slide, please. And then I think the most important lie. Everyone knows that machine learning models are black boxes. Everyone knows that you can't understand what's inside a machine learning model because it's a black box. Everyone knows that this nature of opacity, if you will, renders these models extremely hard to use, and particularly hard to use in regulated uh, environments like lending. This is less a lie than a misunderstanding. Uh, take a step back in time, and I'll, I'll talk about credit. Credit historically has been run using a, a fairly simple piece of mathematics called a logistic regression. Uh, logistic regression creates a, a yes or no decision with some set of signals, and it's, it's sort of happy in the, you know, between 10 and 30 signals. Like at, you know, 30 signals or so, you can't really crush the 31st into it. It just doesn't work very well. So um, logistic regression has a sort of a natural limit of how many pieces of data it can handle. It has all kinds of constraints on the kinds of data it can use. Constraints are rarely met in production, but are, are still there. And so if you build a model to make a credit decision based on logistic regression, it's easy to see what happened and why it happened, because you just look at 30 coefficients. Right? Like look at the numbers, right? Y equals mx plus b, look at the m's. You get a lot, and you totally understand what happened. That's beautiful. It's very powerful. It allows for things like you know, adverse action and other regulatory requirements where you have to explain to a borrower or an applicant why you did or didn't give her credit. It's, and, and that's the reason that, that credit in many fields has been dominated by logistic regression for many years. Um, in contrast, fields like fraud, where there's no explainability requirement, no one has to explain why a fraud decision is made, there's been some amount of more complicated ML used in, in, in fraud. The argument for moving from logistic regression to a traditional, to, to more interesting machine learning models has been, hang on, how do I find those coefficients? How do I explain to you why I didn't make that, that decision? Uh, you can't do that. True, it's like support vector machines, you don't know why they gave an answer, they just gave an answer. Neural networks, you don't know why they gave an answer, you just gave an answer, that's right. But there's been, in 2004, uh, a very powerful paper on explanations in neural networks was published, an academic study, which said if you take the special form of neural networks, you can, in fact, explain why the network did that work. Oh, hey, hang on, maybe that means that neural networks aren't black boxes after all. Um, and so you know, since then, there have been various sundry pieces of academic research, notably done by places like Carnegie Mellon, around how do you expand these black boxes. There have been forms that have been specific algorithms. So there's a commercial product sold um, by one of the credit bureaus, which is, uh, uses a very special form of an algorithm with an explanation. There have been sort of more theoretical approaches. We sell a version which is uh, a computational way of approximating, so you know what happens inside the, the black box. But in any case, there's lots of ways to get into a black box and make it visible, make it, it's just hard. And there haven't historically been any good tools to, to do it. So it's, it's a lie that ML models are black boxes, and it's a lie that you have to consume a model and assume that the black box nature of it is either true or useful. You can expand the black box, it just requires some work. It's not easy yet. Next slide, please. So with that, I want to I wanna leave you with, what I think, the most important lies 
uh, of ML, the most loathsome of lies of ML. We're at the high end of a hype circle, a hype cycle, excuse me, about AI, ML. There's lots of stuff being written in the press, which is really compelling and maybe not necessarily very descriptive. There is a lot of interesting research and lots of interesting companies, and almost everyone says, oh, hey, we're an ML shop now. Almost everyone says, oh, hey, we're, we use ML to, to make whatever it is we do better. Uh, and that's great. Ultimately, ML is eating the world. All those companies will, in fact, use ML to do interesting things. But between here and there, we have to, to, to fight our way through the hype. AI is not magic. ML, whatever, is not magic. It's just math. You can't create information that isn't there. Right? The, the information is there, and you can use it, or it's not. It doesn't rely upon creepy signals that you like, really wouldn't want to talk about at a cocktail party. Or if it does, you, you're, not, you're not doing it right. These are really compelling lies, sadly. So every time we go to a cut client, I get all these questions. Probably you are all getting sold these, um, to sold these, 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 these things that aren't true. So what I would like to have happen, the reason that these, so the reason the AI bubble popped in the 90s is that we promised everything. You know, like there was like lots of, you know, that we promised that we would have human decision, quality decisions made by a refrigerator. That was literally a product. It turns out that that's both hard to do, having human quality decisions made by a refrigerator, and a bit pointless. Because like, do you actually care that your fridge can make human quality decisions? I mean, like, really? I don't, maybe. I think maybe you want to tell you if the, if the milk is spoiled, but short of that, I'm not sure why I care if my, if my fridge is, is intelligent. Part of the reason that I want you all to be armed against the loathsome lies is because I don't want this bubble to pop. I don't want lies and promises and all those things to yield in a couple of years us all stop paying attention to what is the highest leverage thing around us today. To the extent that we can use AI, use ML, I don't care which expression you use, to make better decisions, to help people make better decisions, and to do stuff that people aren't great at, right, that's an incredible social good. To the extent we let those things be done incorrectly or we overpromise what we can do, and we, then we stop making progress towards what it can do, is a huge, huge social loss. Thank you so much.